morning, I want you to turn with me, please. Numbers chapter 13. I want to speak to you for just a little while this morning on God provides. I believe God provides, don't you? Every song that was sung this morning mentioned something about God providing beautiful land. I'm on my way to heaven. And I thought, wow, God, you know exactly what you're doing this morning. Let me start this sermon by talking to you for just a moment. There has been a change in the atmosphere. There has been a change in the world today. Last night from about midnight until about 2 o'clock this morning, there was an anointing that was so strange. It came upon me and I walked the floor. I prayed. It was a heaviness like I hadn't felt in many, many years. This morning I got up and turned the news on and it said that there was a 6.2 earthquake that had hit Baja, California. Last Friday, something happened that the news media never said a whole lot about. In fact, there's been so many things that's been happening they haven't said anything about. There has been major storms with hurricane-type winds that has been all over the Mideast. In fact, NASA looks down upon it and takes pictures of it, and it looks like a hurricane or a tornado with an eye in the middle of the storm. All week long, that has troubled me, and I said, God, this is strange. What is this? All of last week, there was a major dust storm that blew in across all of the Asian countries, including parts of Israel. It looked like a mountain, a wall that was so high that you couldn't see over it. It looked like it went all the way from the ground, all the way to the sky. And I thought, Lord, what is this? I knew in my spirit it had something to do with these final days. So I've studied all week long and run references on this and I was amazed to find that God gave prophecy in Psalms 83 of a great storm was going to come against those who were coming against Israel. In the Bible, you read in Psalms 83 about the wheel. And also in the book of Isaiah chapter 17, it talks about the great wheel that will come in and that will crush, that will bring diseases or pestilence. It will bring the judgment of God. This is what it means. But... It's interesting in the Hebrew what the word wheel means. It means a whirlwind of a dust storm. They said never before has this ever happened this way. Saudi Arabia and Mecca, there was a huge crane. They said a huge wind just come out of nowhere and blew over and killed 107 people. Thursday and Friday of last week, Russia began to fly in transport planes filled with soldiers from several different nations, tanks, armored personnel, rockets, ammo, Rifles, 
Then Putin got on the computer and on the television airways and said, I want all of the nations of the world to come and join me in Syria for a great battle. Psalms 83. Psalm, or Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about the armies that are gathering. What was going on? God said that he would fight their battle for them in Israel. I believe God was brought in, bring, uh, brought in a, a, a dust storm, a whirlwind, a tornado, a hurricane, however you want to look at it, to defend Israel so that the Arab world and Russia could not see what Israel was preparing to do. And it's like a great divide, a wall of great divide between Israel and the rest of the Arab world. I believe God is shaking the earth. Not only is Russia beckoning for the troops, but they announced this morning that Russia, Germany, even American people have been hiding and secretly putting together plans to destroy Israel. The great battle is forming. Russia bragged Saturday, Friday, we have something the world doesn't have. We have unmanned subs that are standing right off of the coast of Israel and Damascus filled with atomic warheads. Our government officials, our Senate, just gave away the rights to America, to the UN, to bring this battle and to arm Iran with nuclear power. You go back and you read the Bible, you will find out there are certain parts of Iran called Elam. Elam, it could be all of these refugees that you are seeing flee from that territory over there could be a fulfilling of this prophecy. For it says the earth would begin to shake. Great earthquakes are going to start taking place what does that have to do with Iran? Because that's the majority of their atomic plants are at where they will make the nuclear power and make the plutonium and make the stuff for the nuclear rockets and the nuclear bombs. They already have bought Russia, sold Iran. They said enough nuclear rockets to hit all of America the west side and the east side and the north and the south side of America and Israel to destroy them. They already have the power. Today is a special day. It's the end of the Shemitah year. And Tuesday, the UN is going to be meeting in France, is coming before the UN. Last night, it was announced by the UN that they had given authority for the Palestinian flag to be raised now as a nation at the UN headquarters in New York. Tuesday, France will submit an agenda that the UN will pass and demand that Israel divide Jerusalem and divide Israel. That's Tuesday, two days from now. By the way, the Semita doesn't start until about 8, 7 or 8 o'clock tonight. Now, what does that mean? What's that got to do with us? Let me remind you that Israel is seven 
eight hours ahead of us. So about right now, between now and one o'clock, anything could happen. Anything. I believe all of these elements that are being put together right now. But it doesn't stop there. The whole month of September is filled with unusual things. The Pope is coming to speak to our Senate and Congress never before. He is bringing a so-called peace plan. Do you know what the peace plan has to do? It has to do with the new buildings. It has to do with the new EPA laws. Bringing all nations under the UN. He, as the religious ruler, is coming to say, we're going to pass it. And then the 27th, or I believe it's the 27th of September of this month, the UN is going to pass an agenda that all nations, kindred, and people of the world will come under their dictatorship and their rule. Things are happening so fast right now. I don't know how many of y'all watched John Hagee this morning, but he was talking about the horses of the apocalypse, and it made perfect sense of what Brother John was saying. He was talking about this nuclear deal that our government just signed off on. Sadly, the people that signed our rights away, they signed a death warrant for us. They okayed Iran to build the nuclear stuff and to have the nuclear stuff to kill Americans with. Iran's already bragged. Alatoma is on the news this morning. They're saying we want Americans, we want them dead. They're putting out contracts and hit lists, Al-Qaeda, saying we want anybody from Israel, anybody from America, we want them dead. And it's going out over the airways. This wars are starting. That beautiful valley of the when you look from off of Mount Carmel down upon it, is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Brother Mike and Linda and Lisa and Brad and my wife and I went for our second tour, and their first tour, then they went back again last year. We went up on the mountain, and we looked over into that valley. But here's the strange part of that valley. Lots of wars have been fought there. And the valley, the, the, when you look down on it, the valley is red. The, the dirt and the soil is already looked like it's stained red from the top of the mountain. They have fish ponds all over it. They have dairy cattle everywhere. But I listened to Jonathan Kahn the other night. Somebody asked him a question standing on the mountain. And they said, where will all of the armies of the world come in at? And he said, they will fill this valley. They will come from the Mediterranean Sea. And China will come from the east, uh, west. And, and he began to name off where all of the countries would come in to, to attack Israel and would come together. And I've told you the story when we were there in 2005, how that Israel had already uh, the big buzzards and stuff that have made their homes in the cliffs right at the head of that valley of Megiddo, or Armageddon as we call it. They've already made their nest there and bearing their young. They go home every year and they come back to the same nest. Well, the Israelis have captured some of these and they said what's interesting is that every one 
of those big buzzards has the DNA that shows what country they came from. And every country that is listed in Psalms 83 and Ezekiel 38 and 39 is where these buzzards are coming from to confirm the word of God. Now, there's so many things going on that it makes my head spin. But I'm going to stop and tell you this morning, if you've ever made up your mind to get right with God, if you're not right with God, today would be the best day you have. Right now would be the best time that you can have. I believe America, as I told you last week, I remember making a statement as I came to speak last Sunday morning. Between now and next week, your world will never be the same. And look at all that's happening right now. Russia's unloading those troops. Those other countries are sending in the armies, getting ready for these battles. But God said, I will fight those battles. Now listen, Isaiah 17, it talks about the destruction of Damascus in Syria. Damascus is where the warplanes, the rockets, the nuclear stuff is being offloaded. And the nuclear sub, uh, Russia's got a port that they have made and built in the Black Sea. It's already there. Everything is being set up right now for this last great battle. But God said, I'm going to send a whirlwind of death. And the angel of the Lord will come down in this dust and he will walk among it and he will destroy. He said, when you go to bed at night, Damascus will be there. But in the morning when you awaken, Damascus will be no more. So Damascus is fixing to disappear off of the face of the earth. And isn't it strange? That's where all the Russians are bringing the armies of the world to. From there, they're going to try to come in and attack Israel. But what I'm fixing to read to you is my sermon thought, and I hope nobody's in a hurry to go home. You need to hear what I'm fixing to preach to you. This might be your last sermon you ever get to hear. Because I believe Jesus Christ is fixing to return in the clouds of glory. I do not believe that we, the children of God, have been appointed to wrath. I believe when that last trumpet sounds. Oh, I forgot to tell you what they're doing right now in Israel. They're tooting the horns. That day of the horn blowing. And when that last horn blows, it will end the year. And a new year will begin. Tomorrow will be a new beginning in Israel. So it could be before this day is over with, we could be in heaven. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying it could be. So you better listen carefully to what I have to say. And I have been warning you for weeks and months and years to get ready. Some have heard. Look around where they're at. Others haven't. Here we are. And I've been teaching and telling you and warning you about this month and the importance of it and, and how what it has to do historically and, and biblically and warning you of the signs of the end. And church, I believe we're fixing to see the world start shaking as we have never seen it before. I believe America is fixing to be shook because... 
turned its back on Israel when they said this morning that Obama and John Kerry had been meeting secretly with the Russian man, Putin, with the Iranian people. You remember a couple of weeks ago the Saudi king just showed up in Washington, came over and had dinner with the president. It was a strange happening. Nobody knew it was going to take place. But if you get in the Word and you'll read, you'll find out it said they were secretly consulting together of how they could destroy Israel. And then they began to make plans. Oh, they didn't want the news media to know it. They didn't want because they knew it would upset America and the Christians. So they tried to keep it a secret, but they forgot about the big ears of God. He knows their plans. He searches the imagination. He knows the thoughts. He knows the words that are spoken. But we're living in a time when we need to know who we serve. We need to be ready. Make sure your sins are under the blood and keep them under the blood. Not just for a few days, but from now until Jesus comes. This is our signals we've been waiting on. The signs and the moon and the stars. We're going to watch them. They start tonight. They've already been coming for the last two years. The red moons and all of the other stuff that's taken place. But these are our signs. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Something's fixing to happen. Get ready. So church, I'm warning you today. Be ready. But I want you to listen to this story. It's a story of a new beginning. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. What was going on in Lot's days? The Supreme Court system, the judges, passed laws. What were those laws? One of the laws was that homosexuality would rule and reign. Marrying of same sexes would rule and reign. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of the Man. July, what happened? Our Supreme Court made up a law of the same thing. I believe if God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the other, the other cities round about, God's going to do the same to America. America is going to pay for the 59 million babies that have been aborted and, and poured their bloods out into the streams and into the ground to run. I believe just as the blood of Abel cried out from the ground to God. I believe those babies are crying out their blood to God. America is going to pay for its sin. And the third thing America is going to pay for, not only is homosexuality and abortion an abomination to God, but I believe the offering of our babies to the strange gods. Israel's land was divided. They were sent and captured and sent into other countries because they were offering their babies as sacrifices to Molech, the god Molech. No different with our babies. And the third thing, we have turned our back on God's land. And on the apple of God's eye, the Jews, Israel. And we have gave the command. It's all right. Go ahead. Let me get in this secret meeting room and plan with you the destruction of Israel. 
God will not tolerate it. These are just three things. Many others I could tell you about. But God has already started judgment with the whirlwinds of dust. Get on your computer and look it up. It is amazing at what you see there. It didn't just come in and blow out. It's been there for days. And I think they said last night that in Israel it had begun to lift. And I said, Lord, have mercy. What is God going to do now? Church, I know what he's fixing to do. God is providing us a way out. I want you to listen to this sermon this morning. I said, I hope you ain't no hurry. If you are, you got to go. Just go ahead and go. Because what I've got to tell you might save your life. What I'm going to preach to you might help you to stand strong. Because I don't know what's coming, but I do know there's going to be a shaking. I do America is going to be shook to its core. Listen. Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Let me stop here. I want you to listen carefully. That was not another, just another man talking to Moses, but the God in heaven, in charge of all things, was speaking to Moses and gave him a command. Verse 2. Send thou men that they may search the land of Cana, which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers. Shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them? As I begin to read this and I begin to do research on it, I found out that the only reason God was going to send spies into the promised land was because of the rebellion of the children of Israel. They were saying, Moses and Aaron, we don't know what land God is sending us into. Here we have been wandering around in the wilderness and the desert. And how do we know what we're fixing to go into is any better than what we got? God heard their murmurings and their complaining and he called Moses and Aaron before him in the temp temple and tabernacle. And he said, I'm telling you to send these people over because of their rebellion. Go with me now to verse 23. They sent the spies into the land. They came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they're brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. Can you imagine a grape so big they cut off a little stick of or a vine of it branch of it however you want to call it it was so loaded and the grapes were so big that it took two men to put it on their shoulders and carry it back in to Moses and Aaron that's a promised land God said, this is what I'm preparing for you. You're going to go in and reap what these ungodly people have sown. God was showing them that he has already made provisions for them before they ever get there. Let's read on. Verse 25. And they returned from searching of the land... After 40 days, they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the will of Paran, 
to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Just like God said it would be. Now they were in agreement up to now of what God had said is true. A lot of church people are in agreement right now with what the preachers and teachers have taught them, the singers have sung. They've told us the Lord's coming. We have seen the fruits of it. We know that we have a promised land a lot better than this that God has prepared for us. Let's go read a little farther, verse 28. Nevertheless, they seen it. They heard the promises of God. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. <laughs> and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Let's don't wait another minute. Let's go right now and possess it all. For we are well able to overcome it. If only the church could hear those words. I don't care what kind of position you're in. I don't care what kind of circumstances you have in your life. Here is a word from God. I am your provider. I don't care what you see. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Blessed are those, Jesus said, that have not seen me, Thomas. And yet they still believe in me. They ain't seen me, but they believe me. And I'm telling you now, the Bible said where sin did abound, grace did much more. Far exceeds anything the devil has to offer. And I'm here to tell you, my God is able. He asked the church a question. Is there anything too hard for me to do? But then he makes another statement. Ye did run well, but who hindered you? And he warned us, the devil is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Who's he looking for? He's looking for the doubters and the powders. He's looking for those that said, oh yes, we've seen the past. We've been there. We've seen what God done. We have experienced the miracles of God. We know how God has moved for us and saved us, protected us. God has provided for us sufficiently. But then here comes this little circumstance along and we begin to look at it and it gets bigger and bigger. But you're standing there with the grapes so big on your shoulder that it takes two men to carry a little cluster of grapes. 
the promagantes and other fruits. Oh, we see the fruits of the promised land. I've seen the healings. I've seen the miracles. I've seen salvation work. I've seen what a difference in the life of a person comes when they get right with God and God sanctifies them and separates them from the world and infills them with the blessed gift of the Holy Ghost. Wow, what a difference. They went from weaklings to power. They went from running with the devil to running after the devil to conquer him. Listen. Caleb told the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Why did he want to go at once? He knew the longer they thought about it, the worse it would be, the bigger the circumstances. The more they thought about it, the more they would doubt it. Why? Because if you give the devil a room to dwell in, he's going to bring chaos into the house. Did you hear what I said? If we allow the devil to come into the church and have his way, it won't be long till he'll have everybody in the church run off or fighting each other. He brings chaos everywhere he goes. Verse 31. But the men that went with Caleb said, Oh, we be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. We've seen those giants. Giants are powerful. I understand. When you look at a man 17 feet tall, 15 foot tall, some say they grew even to 20 and 25 feet tall. That's a giant of a man. And when you're a little man... 5'5 five, five to 5'10, five, maybe even six foot tall. That makes you seem short compared to these giants. Their heads were as big as your body. I understand what they were saying, but that's where God comes in. That's where your faith, you don't walk by sight, you walk by faith. If God says it, I believe it. When God said greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that means there's not a giant in the land that God can't kill and conquer. You listen, David faced the little giant, the little man faced the big giant. All it took was a little rock out of the stream and a shepherd's sling. He didn't have a 30 alt 6 or a 30 30. He didn't have a 357 magnum. He didn't even have a sword or a spear. All he had was a little shepherd's sling and a flat, smooth stone out of the brook. The giant looked at him, mocked him, and laughed at him. Why, you're sending this out to me? <laughs> he didn't know what that little man of God had. You come to me with spear and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. There's not a giant in the land, Caleb said, that we can't take. But they said they're violent people. Oh, we're not able to resist them. Verse 32. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, <coughs> The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature and there we saw the giants 
the sons of Anak, which come out of the Zions. And I want you to underline these next three or four words. And I want you to rehearse these. And I want you to reread these 10,000 times or more. This is what they saw. This is how they felt. And this is what brought an evil report that caused at least two million people to die. <coughs> Lost in the wilderness. And there we saw the giants. The sons of Anak which come out of the giants. And here it is. And we were in our own sight. That's grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. It didn't matter if God had given the command for us to go. It didn't matter if we went in and saw that God had prepared the land for us. It didn't matter if God went in ahead of them and already knew what was waiting on them and how to conquer the giants. No, no. They saw the land. They brought back the fruit of the land. And indeed, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. But here we find them saying, Oh, it's such a horrible land. It'll just eat up the people that goes into it. Then they begin to say, Poor old me. I'm so pitiful. I'm so small. And this trouble is so big, I just can't get over it. I don't know what I'm going to do. You ever heard anybody walk around wringing her hands saying, Oh, this, I just feel so bad today. I mean, ain't nothing going right. Everything's going wrong. What a day, what a horrible day this is. I just can't get nothing to go right. Got on the lawnmower, riding, mowing my yard. Got about a half of it done. He just quit. And I got off of that lawnmower and said, what am I going to do now? I got to get this grass cut. You walk around wringing your hands, what am I going to do? And you look and all that happened is it just run out of gas. But you was already in the tears before you ever got on the lawnmower. You were already convinced of your circumstance. It was so bad. That day was so bad. You already declared it's so bad. Look at all the giants in my life. Some of you might be saying, I know the Lord's coming. But I've got so much baggage in my life. I really don't know if I'd be qualified to go and meet the Lord in the air. All you got to do is believe. Well, that's too simple. Ain't nobody going to hear me now because that's, that's too simple. Oh, I know what I need. I need me a camera and a big display I can put here on the walls. and I can show pictures and my imagination of street old and well I don't know if that would convince me or not because you see I've heard it preached I've seen the fruit of the spirit manifested I've seen blind eyes open deaf ears unstopped I've seen the lame walk I've seen strange things. And I know y'all think I'm crazy. But I remember here having a revival here a few years ago. Some of y'all in this congregation got some feelings put in your teeth. Why? Because you dared to believe God. Oh, but the world says that's just a bunch of baloney. I can't believe that. Why? Because it's never happened to you. Because you've heard 
another man tell you God don't do things that way? Hadn't been long ago I heard a report about somebody shouting and singing and dancing in the church and having a great time rejoicing in the Lord. And somebody said, this is just foolish. Why is it foolish? Because they'd never done it. It never happened to them. Why? Because they wouldn't pay the price. They wouldn't get on their faces before God. They wouldn't pray. They wouldn't read the word. They wouldn't fast. And they wouldn't seek God for the supernatural power to fall upon them and for that supernatural power to use you to do supernatural things for God. I don't want to pay the price. Just remain a doubter. I'm perfectly fine with that. That's the shape the world's in today. We've heard Jesus is coming, but we've not changed our ways. We're still double-minded. I told you the other day, a halfway conversion will send you to hell. A halfway conversion. One side of your brain says this is a double-minded man. One side of your brain says, I believe in Jesus. Most anybody who says, yeah, there's a God. Some just flat denies it, but most says, yeah, I believe there's a God. But the other side of the brain will not ask the Lord to come into their life and be the Lord of their life, and to rule and reign in their life, and take charge of their life. Why? I just can't trust Him. But you're willing to trust this weak flesh to rob you of your victories, to rob you of your paradise in heaven. You're willing to trust this flesh that is lusting after the world and bringing the pride of life. But you refuse to trust the God of heaven who is a holy God and says you're going to have to give up these things. You're going to have to turn from when you're truly saved, there's a change comes in your life. Old things pass away and behold, all things become a new. You become a new creature in Christ. But that part of the brain over here says, oh, but we see the giants. They're bigger than we are. But I'm here to tell you, God is still on the job. God still provides. Nothing, nothing too hard for God to do. As I said last week and week before last and weeks before that, God saves to the uttermost. To the most extreme Depths of sin that you can imagine. God can reach down into that sewer and pull you out and wash you whiter than fuller soap can by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and make you a new being. Hallelujah. They saw the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Meaning we were so small compared to those big giants. We're just little bitty things. Listen. And so we were in their sights. In other words, we're looking at them and we know that what we look like in their sight when they look at us, those great, big, violent, powerful men, when they look down at us little Jews, we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. We know what we already look like. Some of you are looking at your problems right now. You're looking at your circumstances in your home. You're looking at your own life and you're saying, oh, the problems are so big. But I'm here to tell you God is bigger than any problem that's in your life. 
There used to be a song, he's bigger than any mountain, deeper than any sea, higher than the skies above me. He's bigger than anything I've ever seen. And there's nothing he can't do. Then the letter just keeps going in chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and they began to weep and cried. And Abe's cried all night long. Why? Because of an evil report. A few years ago, we were in a revival. This same revival where people had got fillings in their teeth, God healed them. There was a sinner man came to this church. And he came to see his son healed. Paralyzed from his neck down. But there was one of his motorcycle bike riding buddies here that smoked dope with him and drank with him. Who, by the way, had been raised in the church of God all of his life. His mom and dad were ministers in the church of God. I wonder what kind of life he had to live. I wonder what kind of people he saw in his house. They called themselves preachers. And here he is, a drunk and a drug addict. I know he makes his own decisions. But somebody influenced him. Listen. He went to this man. Now... Here's the story. This man, other man had been raised in church all of his life, had went and caught an unclean disease. And the doctor said, you're dying from this disease. So he came for the preacher to pray for him. Preacher prayed for him, and because it didn't happen right then, he brought in an evil report and said, this is all a hoax. He mocked the evangelist. He mocked the church. He mocked everything that had been done and said, I don't believe in any of this. And he went straight to his sinner buddy who had just started coming to church and said, this is all fake. Brought an evil report. Let me tell you something. That man left church that night, never came back. As we know, he departed this life a few months later. Died, lost without God. Because of an evil report, those ten spies that brought in the evil report they testified of the greatness of God. They testified of the command of God. And yes, God, your word was fulfilled. We saw it. And we even brought you some fruit. Oh, the land flows with milk and honey. But now, all of a sudden, I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe all of the past miracles that I've seen. They brought in an evil report and it caused almost two million or maybe four million. And it depends on who does the calculating. Anyhow, they traded. They traded their faith in. When they began to look at the giants and the circumstances and refuse to believe God. Let me tell you a little history. A Jewish rabbi wrote this history. Did you know at this very moment the children of Israel were only 11 days away from the promised land? 11 days but because of an evil report and because it brought rebellion and doubt, the people 
turned her back on God and turned her back on Moses and Aaron and wanted to stone them and kill them and go back to Egypt. There was over two million, maybe even four million people that died in the wilderness never getting to see the promised land. We look at that spiritually and we can say they never made it to heaven. Why? Because of an evil report. What are you saying? I'm saying you better be careful of everything you say. When you're gab yab yabbing behind the preacher's back or behind somebody else's back, you're bringing an evil report into the body of Christ and you're causing people to hear this and it's bringing doubt into their minds, into their heart. Sister Terry, I'm going to do this publicly. And I'm not doing it to embarrass you, but to encourage you. There was a man in this church a while back that told you that God wouldn't hear your prayer. You couldn't be saved. You weren't worthy. Remember that? But we found out a little bit later this same man had been living in adultery, cheating on his wife for 27 years. Who does he think he is? But he was bringing you an evil report, trying to rule over you. Honey, you well on your way to heaven. I'm glad you didn't listen to that evil report. Hallelujah. Be sure your sins will find you out. An evil report kills a church. An evil report will kill your influence. Cause people to die lost. I got to close and I know it. And all the congregation lifted up the voices and cried and the people wept throughout the night. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we had died in the wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land? How dare him, so that we can fall by the sword, and that our wives and children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? I've enjoyed the life of sin better than I have this. I'm not going to get to finish. I'll finish with an illustration. The instrument, please. Several years ago, there was a man come to church. This man, he was really trying his best to live right. I think he was. But he was a man that could never turn loose of the world. He was a man that would never surrender. Remember the two brain two-sided guy, double-minded guy I told you about a while ago. He was a man that had one of those double minds. He came into my office one day. He said, I need to talk to you, Pastor. And I said, go ahead. He said, Brother Smith, I don't understand it. When I was in the world, before I got saved, he said, I lived it up. He told me the name of the bar that he used to visit and play music as a drum player off 58 Highway. He said, I went there for years. I'd drink, I'd do drugs. And he said, we'd go to the mountains, we'd go to Florida. And he said, always had money. He said, but I run my debit cards and my credit cards to their max. But it seemed like we all already always had an extra few bucks at the end of the month. But he said, since I've got saved, he said, I'm paying my tithes. I'm trying to live right. He said, but my bills are piling up so high. He said, I can't pay them. What am I going to do? I said, you need to get somebody to sit down with you. 
get all of your bills and your finances together and explain to you how to work on a budget. When you were in the world, you acted like the world and you thought like the world. You maxed everything you out. You see, the devil cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But as a sinner, you're blinded to his actions of what he's doing to you, trying to destroy you. It's only when you get saved that you begin to see where Satan had you. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do now. We begin to talk. Bought him a new truck. He said, I've been wanting this, had it special ordered. And he said, It's become so bad, Brother Smith. Said, I want you to pray that God will work this thing out for me. And I said, Okay. He said, They're fixing to repossess my truck, and I don't want to lose it. I said, Let's pray about it. He and I sat in the office, and we agreed together. We prayed. I said, Why don't you take this thing back over? to the dealer explain your situation to him he might even buy it back from you or have somebody to buy it from you he said I hadn't thought about that so we went back over to the dealer the next day the dealer saw him pull up on the lot with the truck and he said you're just the man I've been looking for he said I've been trying to find a phone number to call you he said I've got a man that wants to pay cash for this truck. He wants this same truck that you have. He said, I'll take it back right now, just like it is. The miles you put on it, he said, I'll give you back what you paid into it. But he said, you know, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, this is my truck. This is what I want. Double-minded. He said, I ain't about to let somebody else have my truck. Got back in his truck and he told the dealer, he said, well, if I decide to sell it, I'll give you a call. Do I need to tell you the rest of the story of what happened to him? Wasn't long after that, they repossessed that same truck. Now the dealer didn't have to give him his money back. He got his truck back, sold it, made a profit off of it, and he lost. Why? Because he wouldn't listen to God. He doubted God. You walk by sight but not by faith. You lose every time. When you look at the world, man, they're passing by, happy. It looks like a wonderful place to dwell in. But when you begin to inspect the world with spiritual eyes, it's not what you think it is. You're walking in darkness and the world is full of it. People that are half converted, they're partially. Meaning, there is the darkest of dark brightest to bright sin and the holiness of God halfway means you're partially in and partially out it means that you are dwelling in that grave between the darkest of dark and the brightest of bright but because of that where you're at you're doubting God can really do what he said he would do. You refuse to drink of the sincere milk of the word of God that you might grow in grace. You lose every time. But this is not a time for you to be a loser. For God has provided you a way out. He said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the door. I'm the way out. You got to make that decision. Do I want to stay here with the world? And what's fixing to take place? I'm telling you, church, when the wrath of God begins to be poured out, you
you don't want to be here. You don't have to be here. God has provided you a way of escape. God has provided you a way out. We call it the rapture. The Bible calls it the great catching away, which is in the Greek the same thing. It means rapture. God even said, I've not appointed you to be the children of wrath. But I've appointed you to obtain salvation or deliverance through Jesus Christ. That means He saved you. He's made a way of escape for you. So that when He comes in the cloud, and that last trumpet sounds, your feet will leave this earth. Gravitation won't hold you no more. And you'll rise to meet the Lord in the air. And for the time that anointing and glory of God comes upon you, somewhere between this earth and the cloud, you're going to be changed. You're going to take off this old flesh that is morally corrupt. And you're going to put on a new body. You're going to put on a new robe just like Jesus. Now, the children of Israel, because of an evil report, it cost them. They could have went into the promised land in 11 days, but instead they chose 40 years in the wilderness. I ask you this morning, I ask you that are listening to this message over the internet, Would you rather have 11 years with God, letting Him guide you and direct you? Or would you rather have 40 years in the wilderness and desert to die lost? Believe God. Bow your heads. Father, I pray over this people and this message. And I thank you, Lord, for the precious word of God that you have again allowed us to receive. And I know, God, that only you knows what the future holds. But when I read about your children in Israel, you said, Lord, that they were our examples to follow. I read, Lord, in the Word of God in Deuteronomy where you went ahead of them. You already went into the promised land and spied it out. You knew where those giants was at. And you knew how to conquer those giants. You already had a plan. If only we could believe it. You had provided a way of escape. You had provided a land that flowed with milk and honey. But they refused to believe. Though they seen it with their own eyes, they still refused to oh God. And I read in your word where you said, Will there be faith? Will I be able to find any faith when I return? pray, oh God, this day, this night, that you would touch the hearts that have the opportunity to hear this word. Let them believe in you. Let them stop looking at the giants. Let them stop looking at those circumstances that are so big in their lives. Because one of these days, Lord, they're going to lay it all down anyway. When you call them home, Lord, those giants, those homes, those fancy automobiles, this fancy lifestyle, this societal living, we thought of and 
we were willing to despise you and turn our backs on you for. My God, we'll look at it and we'll see that it was vanity, emptiness, nothing. But you, you're our everything. My God, I plead for the blood of Christ to be shed abroad in the hearts of people. I pray for souls to be saved that you would use this church, use this people, use the works of these people to win souls. My God, bless their efforts. Don't let them doubt. Don't let them look back. But let them know God the seeds that they have planted. They've done all that they're supposed to do. Then it's left up to you to bring the growth. Let them keep their eyes on Jesus. I pray this day in the name of Jesus. Loho shakaye lebiyondorobaka Malabokutu pakali hishile makai Deremen and robokute lekai kalerebu utabakaya Shabarondri biki alade Loho u shalemanda Batabekiti ila Loho ulamaka Bikira bakasha Kuta karati lehi Omda eme on hu Aishi kele Lehuku kuramakaya I say unto you my people Live no longer in fear But look unto me The Lord thy God And I shall lead thee Into the paths of safety I shall go before thee Doth not my word say in behind thee And I shall lift thee up and I shall protect thee and cover thee. And I say in just a few days, if thou will be faithful unto me, that I will be faithful unto you and bring deliverance unto you. So hold on, my children. Hold on to my word. Hold on to my spirit. And hold on to the truth that it might lead you unto the land of fair days. That it might lead you unto the place of peace that you have so longed for. And I say unto thee, be faithful to the end, and I shall be faithful to you, saith the Lord. Oh, Jesus, I give unto you praise this morning, Lord. I sent your anointing. I sent your glory in this house. Upon this service and this message. God, the word that you sent here, let it accomplish that. Which you have sent it to do right now. In Jesus' name. Oh, souls winding. Why do you wait? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You praise the name. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I will pray. Father, I ask that you would watch over us and protect us, take care of us. Build a hedge around us and a covering over us, Lord, and keep us safe from harm and back to this house tonight. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. Thank you, visitors, for coming today.